Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Today we're going to take a look at the doctrine of believers' baptism. And every time I come to think about this matter of the doctrine of baptism and why I'm a Baptist, I think about our forefathers who went before us, who suffered the horrible, horrible attacks of this world. Some of them were known as Christians who, who burned them at the stake, who, who uh, uh, literally uh, hung them, who put them, drowned them. Many of them were terribly, terribly mistreated, put in all kinds of torture, all because they believed in what I'm getting ready to talk about, believer's baptism. Listen, folks, we live in a different world, I understand, and we're starting to see a lot of stuff going on. We still have brothers and sisters all over the world who suffer for the sake of Christ. But let me say this to you, beloved. There are a lot of things today that you and I have, have appreciated and enjoyed because that our fathers, our forefathers and foremothers all went through this to give us this freedom. Today we're going to look at John the Baptist at the Jordan River and Jesus coming to be baptized. We have to understand the background of this and think about the Jewish mikvah and think about how all of this came to, to play. There were two basic reasons for a Jewish mikvah. Today you can go to a synagogue and see the mikvah where you can go and, and have a ritual cleansing there at the synagogue. This was also done in the time of Jesus, there on the outside of the Temple Mount. They have found, they have, the archaeologists have found many mikvahs all throughout that area where the believers would come and they would go and immerse themselves in the water to ceremonially cleanse themselves before going up into the Temple Mount to offer their sacrifice. We see there were two basic reasons for this ritual. The first reason was that it was a ceremonial cleanliness in the fact that they had not realized perhaps if they touched anyone or if they come in contact with someone who was ritually unclean and therefore they themselves would be ritually unclean and so therefore they present themselves at the mikvah because they were going to stand before a holy God and give this and give this sacrifice. You know, we, I don't think we really understand the nature of worship in the, in the time of the temple. In the time of the temple, the people approached God with fear and trembling so that they would go before him not wanting any form of uncleanliness upon themselves. And so they would go to this mikvah and they would cleanse themselves. The other reason for a mikvah bathing would be the, the conversion ritual. A non-Jewish believer who became a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who came into the religion of Judaism, would go through what was called a ritual bath or a mikvah to put themselves in that particular uh, category. And they would be called a believer. And so therefore they would introduce that. So here is John, a priest's son, who understands and knows about the mikvah, who himself had already participated in the mikvah, went down to the Jordan River, not to the temple, and began to bathe people ceremonially to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. We see the Christian baptism, the true biblical Christian baptism, confirms, the Bible confirms it was done by immersion. They would brought backward into the water and brought forward. There are no New Testament examples whatsoever in your Bible of sprinkling done of any type of baptism. The Greek word there is baptizo. It means to immerse. And we do so in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus told us in the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28. It is a public profession of Christ and the salvation that we had received. It is not a sacrament of salvation in itself, but rather it is a testimony. It is a public testimony that we have received Christ as our Savior. Now John's baptism, we're going to see here, was by immersion also. And it symbolized a confession of repentance. 
Basically what it was, he was saying, I don't know. Some people said, I don't know what's happened. Maybe I've been touched by a leper. Maybe I got this or that, or what. but I want to have this immersion. I want to repent because I know that the Messiah is coming. They anticipated and prepared themselves for the Messiah's coming. And that's why John the Baptist had taken his ministry out into the, out into the wilderness so that people from all over the area would come to him there at the Jordan River, not to the temple, not to the mikvah baths, but to the river Jordan and immerse themselves in the water, repenting of their sins, preparing themselves for the coming of the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 3, we see that Jesus has come to, the, to John at the Gal of, of the Jordan. He's left the Galilee, come down to the Jordan River. We see in verse 14 and 15 the connotation of baptism. What was baptism all about? Jesus came to John, and what, how did John react to that? Look at verse 14. And John tried to prevent him. <clears throat> John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? And then look at verse 15. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. We see the protest of John in verse 14. We see the purpose of John's baptism. He was thinking, okay, repentance. What does the Messiah, what does the Son of God, what does this man called Jesus, have to repent about. There is no sin in this man's life. He recognized the Messiah as being the Son of God. He recognized the Messiah as coming in human flesh, but in perfection, without sin. So he thought to prepare a message of repentance. Here we see the Messiah coming, asking to be baptized. No, John says, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And so we see he came to present a message of recognition. John came to baptize in the Jordan River for people to repent, but also to recognize a, the coming of the Messiah. John was there for a reason. He knew because God had spoken to him and told him the Messiah was going to come to him and that John would introduce the Messiah. He prepared the way for him. Now the Apostle John, excuse me, the Apostle Paul described John's baptism in Acts chapter 19 and verse 4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. John says, you come and repent of your sins, and when the Messiah comes, <clears throat> you believe in him. You follow him. And so we see here in, in Acts, John, uh, Paul described John's baptism. And then in Acts chapter 19 and verse 4, Paul had also said that, that he would come. Paul said John preached that the Messiah would come, that this baptism was a forerunning, so to speak, of the coming of the Messiah. Our baptism changes that. Because we're not saying the baptism, we're baptized because Jesus is going to come. We're going to be baptized because he's already come and saved us. And so now we're not repenting in our baptism. We're recognizing him as Messiah. We're recognizing him as a savior. And we're going to follow him in life. The apostle John wrote in John the first chapter. Turn a little bit to your right. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first chapter. And verse 29, <clears throat> John here begins to talk about the, uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. And here we see in John 1 verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him <clears throat> and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. John was saying, I was born before Jesus, six months ahead of Jesus. But he was before me. He was from old, so to speak. <clears throat> Verse 31, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending up from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, 
<clears throat> but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. This is how John introduces the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Apostle speaking of John the Baptist. We see the premise of Jesus' baptism. Why was Jesus baptized? Well, the obvious reason, according to Scripture, is that God wanted to show John that this was the Messiah. But you see, Jesus never, uh, never baptized anyone. If this was so important for salvation, why didn't Jesus baptize people? But you see, he commissioned his followers to do so after they had been saved. We see his mission, the mode, a picture was immersion, which speaks of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We see that as we go into the water. I bring a baptismal candidate down, we're standing in the water, we picture Jesus as he hung upon the cross in the vertical position. And then I lower them down into the water, which pictures Jesus' death and burial. And when I bring them up out of the water, it pictures Jesus' resurrection. And so this is the picture, this is the mode that we would immerse. And what is his ministry? His ministry, again, is a message of a picture. Immersion speaks of the death of Christ, that Jesus came for this purpose, to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die for us, he came to pay the penalty for our sins. We are helpless without that. You see, the sins of, that we have had all our life, one sin is worth the fact of dying and, and going to hell. But you see, Jesus came to change all of that. Jesus came that he might live and die for us and pay the price for us. So we see this testimony, this message of picture, talks about his death. But it also talks about his burial. You see, Jesus had taken our sins as he had them upon himself, upon the cross. He took our sins into the grave, what is called in the, in the, the New Testament, Sheol. And Sheol was the place where the people who had departed from death had gone down into. They didn't go to heaven right away. They went to a place in, the, old, in the, the time of Jesus into a place called Sheol. Or as he talked about there in Luke chapter 16, Abraham's bosom. And so Jesus took our sins down into that, that area called the grave or Sheol. And there he gave that wonderful, wonderful ministry to those who were held captive, those who populated this area. And he brought them out at the resurrection, took them to heaven. As Paul says, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord today. We don't go to a place called Sheol. We go straight to heaven because that's what Jesus came for. His death, his burial, and his resurrection gave us that ministry. Jesus' baptism was a commission of the great... Jesus talked about his baptism given to us, commissioned to us at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said we are to go into all nations. Do you realize that I can find believers anywhere I go? Isn't that exciting? Many years ago, we went down to Brazil, all the way down something. Man, I had never been that far away from home. All the way down to Sao Paulo, all the way down to the lower end of the, of the South America. And lo and behold, we found believers there. Years later, I went to the Philippines. Guess what? I found believers there. Went to Europe, found believers there. Went to Africa, found believers there. Went to all different places. Folks, listen. We were told from the very beginning that we would go all to all the places of the world and the gospel has gone. The teaching of the Christians have gone throughout the entire world. That ministry, all because of Jesus' baptism. In verse 15, we see the persistence of Jesus. John says, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not doing this one. And Jesus said in verse 15, <clears throat> but Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. See the testimony of Jesus' baptism. 
If baptism was a sacrament of salvation, why was Jesus baptized? If, if this baptism saves me, if the sacrament of baptism is something that saves me, why was Jesus baptized? Did Jesus need to be saved? This is the Son of God. He's without sin. He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus had no sin, so why was he baptized? We see the testimony of Jesus' baptism is very simple. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, that's the mission of the cross. That our sins were placed upon him and he died for our sins. That was the cross, not the baptism. The baptism doesn't wash away our sins. The baptism shows us of the mode and the message and the method of Jesus' salvation. That he came to die for our sins, that he rose from, that went to, was buried for our sins and he rose from the dead to give us life everlasting. Then we see the timing of Jesus' baptism. You see, one of the unique factors of this on how we can understand this baptism of Jesus is to think about when he was baptized. Was he baptized after he got saved? <laughs> I don't think Jesus ever got saved. I don't think he had a need to. You know, there are people that I know that have said on TV and different places and books I've read where Jesus didn't know he was the Messiah until he was baptized. Well, that's not true. Mary and Joseph knew he was the Messiah before he was baptized. And so we see that Jesus came into this world knowing that his mission in life, he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus' baptism was just before his public ministry. And what is that a picture of? That's a picture of the priests who always washed at the laver just before their service in the temple. The priest would come and he would bring his own, his own sacrifice for his sins. And the priest would go to the other priests and they would transfer his sins upon that, that animal. That animal was sacrificed for his sins and placed as a burnt offering upon the altar. And then the priest would turn as he gets ready to do his work there in the temple or there in the tabernacle. And he would stop at the laver and he would wash his hands and he would wash his feet before he went in to do the work of the Lord, before he went to, to ignite and to turn on the, so to speak, the menorah, the light of the menorah, or go to the table of showbread and there put the, the, the uh, uh, bread of showbread there on the table, or there before the altar of incense to put the incense upon there to be the prayers of the people. He would always stop by the laver and wash his hands and wash his feet. And so Jesus was getting ready to open up his public ministry, three and a half years. And so what did he do? He came into this issue. He came into this point and he said, I'm going to begin my ministry like the priest and I'm going to wash. So Jesus' baptism was just before his public ministry. Again, the priest always stopped at the labor just before his work. You see, baptism separates us for service. That's what the purpose of it is. That's what the purpose of believers are. Why is it that we are baptized after we're saved? Because we are baptized to separate ourselves for service. Each and every one of us are called to service for God. The Bible says each and every one of us are called to service to, to our own families, to our friends, to our associates, to people we know, that we might share the good news of Christ. So baptism separates us for service. It's a readiness for service. It's a ritual of Christ's fulfillment. As a high priest, Jesus always fulfilled the, the laws required for the priesthood. Jesus went to bathe, to immerse himself there in the water just as the high priest would go and wash himself before the, the, uh, his sacrifice of the of the uh, sacrifice of the brain just want to hold the sacrifice of the atonement sacrifice of the atonement we see as high priest Jesus fulfilled that law's requirement of the atoning sacrifice Leviticus chapter 16 verse 24 says and he speaking of the high priest shall wash his body with water in a holy place put on his garments come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people 
You see, Jesus was the high priest of our faith, or he is the high priest of our faith. Not after the order of, of Levi, because Jesus was not a Levite, but rather he was from the tribe of Judah. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews that he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And therefore, Jesus, as the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, went to this baptism and washed himself because he was getting ready to make that atoning sacrifice, the burnt sacrifice. And what was the burnt sacrifice? It was the one sacrifice that was not split up among the priests and the family, was not split up among the, among the people there, but rather it was wholly consumed upon the fire. And Jesus was going to go on the cross, holy, being wholly consumed by the fire of judgment of sin. And therefore, as he began to enter into that, he chose to go to be baptized that as the high priest would wash himself to prepare himself for that sacrifice. Next we see in verse 16 and 17 the confirmation of baptism. We see in verse 16 a vision of his blessing. In verse 16 it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. We see in verse 16 a vision of his blessing, the affirmation of the Spirit. The Spirit of God came and rested upon him. He was anointed. You see, once again, the anointing is very important. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. This anointing of the Holy Spirit was extremely important for the ministry of Jesus and for the recognizing of himself as the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 11, turn there to a little bit to the left. You go on past the, the minor prophets. You go into Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and then there's Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. We see he's talking about the Spirit of the Lord here alighting upon the Messiah. Why is it? This is called the anointing. This is called the anointing of Jesus. We see the gates of heaven have been displayed. That the angel, or excuse me, the Holy Spirit came as a dove from the portals of heaven. Came forth to light upon Jesus. We see the glory of heaven was declared by that process. No one else in John's baptism that happened. John was told by the Father who had called him into this ministry that when you see this one person who comes to be baptized and that Holy Spirit comes and lights upon him, that is the one who is the Messiah. We see in John 1, again, I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so we see the affirmation of the Spirit, but we see the anointing for service. Look at his sovereignty. The Bible talks about the Messiah. And what does that Messiah mean? Mashiach. What does that mean? It means the anointed one. And what is that anointing but the anointing of the Holy Spirit? You see, when the, there were only three, uh, three offices of Israel's religion that were anointed. Anointed by oil before they even served. The first was the prophet. The prophet was anointed by oil. And then there were the priests. The priests were anointed by oil. And not only the prophet and the priest, but the king was anointed by oil. And what we need to understand that this was a forerunning, telling us about the coming of the Messiah, that he would be a prophet, a priest, and a king. 
All three roles wrapped up into one, the anointed one. And we see he fulfilled all these three roles. Jesus as the prophet like Moses. Jesus as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus the king after the family of David. All three of these roles Jesus fulfilled. And so he was anointed for that purpose. And that anointing, no priest anointed him, no prophet anointed him. God the Father anointed him with the Holy Spirit of God. So we see his sovereignty. And then we see his service as the anointed one. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Isaiah chapter 61, in Isaiah chapter 61, starting with verse 1, we see he was anointed to preach. He was anointed to proclaim. He was anointed to prepare. In verse 1 of chapter 61, says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Jesus came anointed by God. He was anointed to preach the good news. He was anointed to proclaim the message of salvation, and he was anointed to prepare the way that we could be saved. We see also not only this time of vision of blessing, but there was also a voice of blessing. Also a voice of blessing. Look at verse 17 in, in Matthew chapter 3. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Oh, John heard it. Jesus heard it. I don't know how many people heard it, but John heard it because that was his message. That was his, his affirmation that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. It was a confirmation of the Father. Jesus was confirmed by the Father saying, this is my beloved Son. There are those who do not believe that God has a Son. There are those who believe that God never could have a child. But what we see is here that the Bible says that God himself confirmed, this is my beloved son. He's a son of deity. Psalm chapter 2 verse 7 says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said, to me you are my son, today I have begotten you. All the way back in the Psalms. David wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God said their day would come that his son would be among us. That he would walk with us, talk with us. That he would laugh with us, he'd cry with us, he'd eat with us. And all the things that humans are involved in, humanity of Christ was involved in too. But oh beloved, he was without sin. And he walked that way without sin that you and I might know that our sins were placed upon him, that he would be the sacrifice for those sins. The son of deity, the son of devotion, in whom I am well pleased. Isaiah 42 verse 1 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elected one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Oh, beloved, that was the plan of God from the very beginning of time all the way back to the garden when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden because of their sin God told them I'm going to bring one for you he's going to come in power and authority he's going to come and the old devil is going to to bruise his heel but he will crush his head and oh beloved we see that the time in John's ministry was that he would see him and introduce him as a priest after the order of the Levites, that he would come and introduce Jesus. 
And so we see a confirmation of the Father. God the Father before John the Baptist and before the people said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We see a confession of his faithfulness. He is the, he is the presented Lord, my beloved Son. There's no one else that ever came in history that God ever said, this is my beloved Son. Moses, one of the greatest, greatest uh, uh, persons in the Bible, one of the greatest figures of all the Old Testament. Moses, who has gone through all the history of the who's who's of the Jews. Here we see Moses. and He is not put on the same level as Jesus. Why? Moses wasn't even allowed into the promised land. Do you realize that Moses was stopped because of his sin to even go into the land that God had promised? But do you know that there was a very interesting thing later on in the life of Jesus at the, what they call the transfiguration? That Jesus took three of the disciples, they went up on top of what they call today Mount Tabor. And there the Bible says a cloud came down and the, the three saw Jesus standing and talking with Elijah and with Moses. And there they were in the land of promise and Moses' feet were on the ground. Moses, for the first time in his life, was able to walk in the land that had been promised to the people. That the law said to Moses, you sin, you cannot go. But you see, the grace of Jesus brought him there. It was the law that prohibited Moses from going into the promised land. The law says, you've sinned and you will fall short. But you see, the grace of Jesus, when he came into this world, he brought the great patriarch Moses Onto the land of promise. And oh beloved it's the law of Jesus. Who, the love of Jesus and the law of Christ. That brings us into the promised land. We see us presented as Lord. And he is the perfect lamb. First, John excuse me. The first chapter verse 29 says. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. And said behold. The lamb of God. Who takes away the sin. Of the world. Afterwards, after Jesus' baptism, John, Jesus had come down and John said, Look, there he is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew his, miss, his mission. John knew why Jesus came. John knew because God had shared with him he's going to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, I remember many years ago when I was an 11-year-old child there in the service. The Holy Spirit speaking to my heart, this is what you need. This is what you need. It wasn't audible. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard the confirmation voice of saying, this is what you need. This is what you need. And oh, I put it off for a little while, and I said to, to the Holy Spirit, I, I, I'll do this next week. I'll do this some other time. And then the Holy Spirit said, he, he, he said, no, now is the time. And I said, no, not, not today, not today. And then I got thinking, okay, we're about done with this thing, with the, the, almost done with the verses of the song. Lord, if you give me one more verse, I promise you I'll go forward. I thought, I'll get out of this real easy. The preacher says, he gets up and he said, we're going to have one more verse. <laughs> and that verse is for you. And I went, oh, whoa. <laughs> and I remember pushing my way through those little folding chairs and walking up and giving my heart to Christ. Oh, beloved, listen to me. He's real. He's real and he loves you. And he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is the second Adam without sin. The perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Turn into your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2. We're going to take a look at the biblical purpose of baptism. What is it for us today? What about this thing called baptism is so important for us? Why is it an issue for us? Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 40. Saint Peter, oh Peter the apostle, is standing up before the people in Jerusalem there at the temple. And he's preaching the news of Jesus. The very first sermon ever preached by Peter. And the Bible says that he began there and he began to preach. And look at verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word 
were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and of prayers. We see something very interesting. We see in verse, in verse 41, Then they who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. What we see in this manner is very simple. That today baptism is a public profession. That it's an opportunity for you and for me to go into the baptismal tank and to share with all the people gathered here that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that he died for our sins and we believe that he rose again. And so we have a public profession today with baptism. And not only that, but also we have church membership with, with baptism. The Bible says very simply in verse in verse 41, the Bible says, And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Added to whom? The church. And so this baptism was not only a, an opportunity to profess Christ publicly, but it was an opportunity to become a member of the church. We see the right moment. When were they baptized, folks? We see it was after their salvation. It was not before. They did not use baptism to save them. And then the right mode, the immersion, the Bible says in verse 41, they were baptized. That word baptized there is the word baptizo, which means immersion. And then the right message, that right message with the baptism, immersion, death, burial, and resurrection. And then the right motivation to follow Christ and to serve him. That's why we're baptized today. Baptism doesn't save you. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, and you go down to that baptismal pool, you're going to come out a wet sinner. Beloved, the only way you're going to receive Christ is here today, now in your heart, with the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Receiving Christ today is the most important thing you can do. Baptism is the most important thing, first thing you can do, most important first thing you can do as a Christian, to follow Jesus, to be just like him. You know, that's the only thing in the Bible that Jesus says, I want you to do this just like me. That this is the only thing in our life that we can do just like him. And that is to be baptized. And so we see, the question is very simple, are we saved? And if we're saved, have we been biblically baptized? And if we've been biblically baptized, are we serving the Lord? And if so, the question is, who are we serving? Ourselves or the Lord? And so we see the baptism is very important. It sets us apart. It gets us ready to walk down that path. To follow the Lord in baptism means to follow him in the path of life. That as we look back, as we go among the journey of life, we look back and sense the fact that we are living for him. We're walking with him. And that we have this badge of of fellowship as we follow him in baptism, as we walk the paths of life, that we have been put into the family of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the ministry of John the Baptist and upon the baptism of our Savior, Jesus. Father, we understand that baptism doesn't save you. It's, it's merely a picture. It's merely our public profession. But, oh, Father God, we thank you for Jesus who came to seek and to save that which was lost. If there be anyone here today or those who are watching on YouTube who have never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, allow the Holy Spirit to say to them right now, this is what you need. And, oh, Father God, speak to that heart today. Let them know that Jesus loves them that Jesus willingly died for their sins, to cleanse them from all unrighteousness and to give them life eternal. And if they would but accept him as their savior and invite him into their hearts, well, they could have eternal life. Oh, Father God, we're all in that same boat. We're all sinners. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there are those in that boat, it's sinking, death is coming. And those in that boat who have received that life preserver of Jesus. 
And we know that even if death should come, now we have eternal life through Jesus. And if there are those who would like to receive the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life, let them pray something like this and mean it in their hearts. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I confess my sins and repent of my sins and ask that you would forgive me there upon the cross. And dear Jesus, I know that I have fallen and, and have not followed you in the path I should. And so come into my heart and save my soul. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. And now come into my heart and save my soul. And to the best of my ability, Jesus, I'll live the rest of my life for you. As we continue in prayer, Father God, speak to those hearts, whether here or even on YouTube, that perhaps prayed that prayer, that they would make it public, share it with a family member or friend, or even come in a service time and share it with us. Whatever decision is made today, Father, let it be done for your honor and your glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred.